In 2011, three bands from Belgium, Univers Zero with drummer and composer Daniel Denis, Présent with composer Roger Trigot and Aranis with young composer Joris van Finkelroye, performed first time ever with their project called Once Upon a Time in Belgium at the Rock in Opposition Festival in La Maison de la Musique in Carmaux, southern France. I had traveled from Washington, D.C. to come here and find out more about Rock in Opposition, an initiative created by five European bands back in 1978. The movement had a short-term life before it defined an entire subgenre in progressive rock. What was the purpose of Rock in Opposition? Why did the movement only last for two years? What had become of the founding members and the bands associated with Rio? I set out to a journey that would take me to England, Belgium, and France, from New York to the Rocky Mountains, and from Washington DC to the Pyrenees, to meet the old guard and discover the new champions. But first, let's go back and start at one of the many beginnings of this story. Il y a énormément de musique dans le monde. Moi, j'ai toujours dit, je compose mes manques, les musiques qui me manquent, celles que je n'entends nulle part. French legendary progressive rock band Magma came to Washington DC in 2010. Magma was founded in Paris in 1969 by classically trained drummer Christian Vander. Pour moi l'idée n'est pas de, de découvrir l'univers mais le cosmos intérieur. Donc l'idée de pénétrer en son propre esprit et découvrir à nouveau un univers et dans celui-ci plonger encore et encore et encore. Over the last 40 years, Magma has created an extensive body of unique and uncompromising original music. We're basically here in Washington, D.C. at Les Maisons Francais, which is a nice little music venue that is situated on the grounds of the French Embassy. But the main draw of the evening will be, I mean, the uh, very rare U.S. performance of the legendary French band Magma. When you talk to people who've never heard of Magma, you say, well, what do they sound like? It's like, you can't answer that question because it's their own thing. I mean, the only bands who sound like Magma are bands who were influenced by Magma. I've known Magma for 32 years. I like the band because uh, the music is a fusion of uh, jazz and a lot of classical music. And if we talk about classical music, it would be something like Karloff, like uh, Stravinsky. <laughs> During Magma's founding years in the late 60s, when Flower Power was on the schedule, Vander did not sympathize with the musical trend. Quant aux fleurs et, et au côté peace and love, j'avais beaucoup de, je connaissais beaucoup de personnes qui du jour au lendemain étaient devenues des gens d'amour entre guillemets, et ça je n'y croyais pas trop. Je me suis dit peut-être un jour ça viendra, mais c'était pas le moment. On était toujours dans une sorte de, de guerre, qui se passe quelque chose dans un monde où les gens euh, rêvaient sur des réverbes assez longues, des, des accords de guitare qui emmenaient, bon, comme on disait à l'époque, planer. Euh, ce n'était pas l'idée. Moi, j'avais plutôt l'idée d'une musique euh, dans la sobriété et dans le silence. So 
donc on, on s'est habillé au départ en noir, très peu de couleurs. Ça, c'était quand on a commencé les concerts. Magma somehow managed to make a kind of music using elements of James Brown, John Coltrane and Carl Orff. That's impressive. You know, one, choose one from each music group. So the classical music world, and the jazz music world, and funk rock music world. Christian's compositions are really evolved. They're complex, the guy's deep. Magma were a band who, who did stand tall in the world of bands because they were so good, like Frank Zappa, for instance. You know, Frank Zappa was not just one of a bunch of L.A. bands, you know, because he covered so much more ground. I think Magma was one of the most powerful band in, in the 70s, and there was a lot of others, but they are not there anymore. Magma is, is, is still there, so there is always young musicians that can listen to the music because the album is still available. Magma was also important in the 70s because the band opened up a tour circuit in France that didn't exist before with the help of Giorgio Gamelski, London-based manager and promoter of the Rolling Stones and the Yardbirds. Giorgio realized early the potential of Magma, and while in France he saw the opportunity to build a tour circuit. They couldn't get any jobs. None of the progressive bands, or so-called, were able to play. It's very interesting because I found that there was another kind of institution in France that, that you could lean on to create a circuit. And it was La, La, La Maison Jeune de la Culture. They had a little concert hall for 200 people, little, little stage, etc. So I went to the guy that was running the place and I asked him, what concerts do you put on? And he said, oh, we don't put on any concerts. We, we don't have the money. And we have like 200 of these. And my, my mind is going, wow, 200 of these. You know? So I, where are they? They said, oh, all over the country. I said, all over the country? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it's my circuit. We did Magma's first concert. They did 25 gigs, 20 miles apart, 30 miles, because the distances in Europe are, you can digest them. Giorgio became the manager of Magma, and the influence of Magma's music started to grow across Europe. Magma has been an incubator for a lot of musicians who have played with the band over the years. One of these musicians is the drummer Daniel Denis. Denis joined an early incarnation of Magma in 1972, and for a while, Magma existed with two drummers. On avait fait la première partie, Arkham, euh, la première partie de Magma en, en concert en, en Belgique. Et alors, euh, Christian Vander nous a demandé à Jean-Luc et à moi de faire partie de Magma. Moi, j'étais très jeune, très nouveau, j'étais catapulté dans un groupe qui était vraiment déjà très très établi, très loin. Je suis revenu en Belgique. Je me suis souvenu qu'on on répétait dans un local où il y avait un autre groupe. Et là, il y avait Roger Trigo, Guy Sekers, qui jouait dans ce groupe. Et on s'est dit, c'est comme ça que ça s'est construit petit à petit. Univers Zero was founded in 1974 by Daniel Denis and Roger Trigo. Au départ, Univers Zero est né de d'abord un amour de gens comme Miles Davis, Magma, une musique qui était, euh, je dire, qui apportait quelque chose à l'époque de euh, nouveau, une énergie. Et à certains moments, on s'est dit, il faut qu'on cherche euh, notre propre son, notre propre langage. Univers Zero's particular sound was refined when classically trained oboist Michel Bergmans joined the ranks with his bassoon. Le basson est un, un instrument très rare partout. Il n'apparaît que dans l'orchestre symphonique. The grandfather in Pierre et le Loup. C'est à l'intérieur, c'est dans la mémoire collective. Et il n'est quasi, à l'époque, personne ne joue du basson dans un groupe rock, à part Lindsay Cooper 
et Denis Brelli. Euh, jouer du basson avec une guitare électrique, c'est merveilleux. C'est un son fantastique. Évidemment, ça a tout de suite donné un cachet à la musique d'Univers Zero. Univers Zero's debut album, 1313, was released in 1977. Its second album, RSI, released in 1979, is widely regarded as one of the darkest albums of all times. event it wasn't just any old rock concert you would go and see and then come away saying well it wasn't bad because the power that uh, Universe Zero had on the audience was almost overwhelming and then these guys all dressed in black and they would carry on making a little bit more noise the result was that after five or ten minutes half the room was empty you couldn't sort of like it a little bit and maybe listen to something else. Either you hated it or you really, really got involved in it. That was what Universe Zero was. Et c'était une manière à nous d'exprimer une certaine révolte aux autres groupes un petit peu peace and love. Et voilà. On, et puis d'un côté, on a, on a un petit peu insisté là-dessus, parfois à tort, parce que ça nous a donné une image très noire, lugubre. C'était pas vraiment non plus notre notre but. It was a different trend. It was anti-commercial, completely alternative to what the mainstream scene was, was showing. Univers Zero is one of the five bands that founded the rock and opposition movement in Europe back in 1978. When Univers Zero came to Washington DC in 2010, it was a very special moment. Universe Zero from Belgium, they are one of the five bands that originally founded the movement. And they are, I think, the only one that's still active. in opposition was the brainchild of drummer Chris Cutler of Henry Cow, an avant-garde rock band from England founded in 1968 by multi-instrumentalists Fred Frith and Tim Hodgkinson. Chris Cutler joined Henry Cow in 1971. I decided to travel to London and meet Chris Cutler to know more about the origins of the movement. Henry Cow had already nailed its flags to the mast of complexity, composition, additive rhythm, importing elements from other musical styles, especially 20th century classical music styles. So that was already started by the time I joined. Henry Cow were a bunch of really highly talented people, and they were all talented in different areas, and they were also very competitive. So everybody was bringing into it everything that they knew and taking from everybody else anything that was interesting. So, you know, when Fred started to do things with amplification, everybody started to amplify. Lindsay would amplify the bassoon, I amplified the drums. We would be given things to play by, by Fred and Tim that we couldn't play, so we'd have to learn new techniques to play it. And we were also one of the only bands who, and I think in this, maybe Frank Zappa is somebody who was a, a model and also working in the same area. The complexity of some of the compositions is matched by the freedom of a lot of the improvisation. So we weren't just doing our written stuff and seeing how far we could take composition, but also we were very committed to free improvisation. At least 40% of any Henry Cow concert would have been improvised. <laughs> Yeah. 
we were trying to rewrite what rock music was because rock music was still considered to be something something to throw away it wasn't serious jazz was serious rock music wasn't serious at all and we were saying yes it is serious you know there's really we can do interesting things with this form and things that no other form can do audience who were always a bit confused by us. We were never properly accepted. We were too strange even. So we were always on a fringe. And what the public that came to see us thought, I really couldn't say. Henry Cow decided to break its contract with Virgin Records. In those days, contracts would tie you hand and foot and make you pay for everything and give you nothing. So Henry Cow never earned anything from any of our albums from Virgin. Although its reputation was established, the group struggled to survive because record companies weren't interested in their music. Most European bands faced the same situation of being isolated, not able to connect with an audience because no record label would sign them. Henry Cow decided to do something about it. For this you have to thank Virgin Records. We were invited to play in all of the countries of Europe and partly that was because we were British and we were known about, we had some sort of a name. Whereas French and German and Italian bands, who were just as good as us, were not invited to play anywhere outside their own country for the most part. So in this respect we were lucky because we travelled and by travelling we brought a lot of these people together, which is you know, why Rock in Opposition happened in the end. Then, I don't know whose idea it was, but we thought we really should get together with all the other people in Europe and make the point in Britain that this idea, which still somehow persisted, that the interesting stuff was coming out of the UK, because it came out of the UK in the 60s and the early 70s. And it was clear to us that all the interesting music was now coming out of Europe. It's going to be one concert, so we can't have more than four or five bands. So and we should probably take one from each country to be representative and we should probably make them as different as possible. So who do we know? Who, who should we invite? It was just, it was arbitrary. The five original rock in opposition bands were Henry Cow from England, Univers Zero from Belgium, Stormy Six from Italy, Etron Fou Le Loublanc from France and Zamla Mamas Mana from Sweden. <music> My name is Lars Kranz and I played bass in Samla Mamas Mana. We started the group in 1970. They played kind of a humorous, complex, progressive rock. We found that humor and laughing is a very good key to people's heart. <laughs> probably the most successful in their home territory of the five bands. My impression is that they sold a lot of records in the 70s. This one, the second one, is called Måltid. It means dinner. And you see on the picture, old couple is doing some dinner <laughs> on the bench. Lars Holmer was the uh, leader of Samla Mama Smana. He was the keyboard player. He played piano and organ. The accordion actually came later. He didn't use it in Samla. He passed away actually on Christmas Day in 2008. Yeah, it was a great soul, I think. And it was, uh, we missed him a lot now. <laughs> Thank you. 
it's very sad because Lasse was a very positive person and he did a great job in Sweden and in the north of Europe. He was a major figure in the very early rock in opposition groups. Etron Fula Leblanc were from France. I saw them actually in England in June of 1977. Uh, I've got this lovely poster here from their 1982 US tour. Dans un registre d'une autre tonalité, voici euh, Plus rien ne nous retient dans ce pays, euh, une chanson concernant les autoroutes et les restaurants d'autoroutes. Their message was actually very funny and very uh, dry humor. And for much of their existence, they were a trio of sax, bass, drums, and vocals. But what made the band so unique, I think it was the balance between Gigu's drumming and Ferdinand's bass playing. His bass was different, the pitch was higher than a normal bass. of Gigou of playing the drums was really heretic and playing as many as possible of 5-4 or 9-8 or 11-8 or 13-8 uh, as he could. And mixing those together made something you never heard of. <laughs> well, in 79, Etronfou was already uh, six years old. We had already like each of us 10 years of experience. And when I'm talking about experience, I'm talking about contacting the record companies, trying to make a little uh, spot in the, in, the, in the music business, talking to music journalists. And uh, we were, you know, finding closing doors. Uh, uh, since we were not playing the music, the middle, the middle of the road thing, and uh, we were looking for solutions. The, the rock in opposition point was uh, the good point where all these guys came with all these questions and all these experiences at the same time on the same spot, on the same subject, and get out of that with a kind of a common position and a common pride, saying, "Okay, we can do it." We we. We, okay, they don't want us, no problem. We are going to organize ourselves all together, create a collective, and that will work. Stormy Six were probably the longest live of the rock and opposition bands. I know they opened up for the Rolling Stones when the Rolling Stones toured in Italy, and they were a pop group. And then they turned into a folk band with lefty lyrics. They were probably involved both for their music, which was excellent, but also for their politics. By the time they got involved in rock and opposition, they had a cooperative called La Orchestra, which was a cooperative for putting on shows. It was also a record label cooperative. My name is Franco Fabri. I'm in Milan. I'm one of the members of the band Stormy Six. We're one of the founding groups of rock in opposition. And the band has been existing since 1965. And it is still existing, though it does a few gigs every year. Ogni respiro, ogni trine, nei corridoi Mentre marciano in divisa, vanno i plebei Vanno in processione col camice e il regolo i quiz La superbia, l'ignoranza e la routine We started collaborating with Henry Cow, organizing concerts for them in Italy. They had started as a band recording for a well-known label, Virgin, and then they stopped their contract with that label and started producing uh, themselves. The same uh, had happened to, to us, the Stormy Six. We had been tied with a contract with one of the Italian majors, and then at some point we stopped and in 75, we had produced our first album with our own uh, cooperative. In opposition, at that time, it was still meaningful to be in opposition to the 
five major record labels and the two major distributors and the people who basically had the whole thing sewn up. You know, if they didn't want your music to be heard, they were in a position to do something about it, still, at that time. You know, you just wouldn't get distributed, you wouldn't get asked to do any concerts, they wouldn't put your record out. So in that respect, we were in opposition to that structure, supporting the alternative structure, make your own album, organise your own tour, let's organise tours for each other, you know, mutual support. So you present a whole concert of stuff and that makes an impact. If we just got Etron Fu over and done a concert, nobody would take any notice. We ran a big festival, we did a lot of publicity, we gave it a kind of, you know, a memorable name, Rock in Opposition. We sold it to the music press, and we made an impression. The official launch of Rock in Opposition was a seven hour festival at the New London Theatre on March 12, 1978. The concert caused an impression with glowing reports from the alternative press and features in some major weeklies. We never had press before and suddenly we had all the English press and even the, the, the biggest press like su subtitling Alone Against Apathy in Belgium and that was crazy. The world knew us suddenly. After that concert, before everybody went home, we, we all had a meeting in the house that I used to live in and everybody said, this is a really good idea. Let's, let's extend the thing a bit further. You know, we'll, we want to do a festival in, in Italy. We want to do a festival in Sweden. So, so we decided to continue the thing as a formal organisation. Ce groupement a permis aussi à, à ce que chaque groupe invitait les autres groupes dans leur propre pays. Donc on a pu vraiment sortir de, de la Belgique. Et donc ce qui nous a permis de jouer à, en Angleterre, qui nous a permis de jouer à Milan, qui nous a permis de jouer à Paris, en Suède, à, à Stockholm. On essaie de partager tous les contacts et les ressources que nous avions. On essaie de distribuer nos records dans tous les pays où un groupe était uh, opérateur. Et c'était... Uh, an important uh, success for all of us. Nobody would have cared about us in other countries. While uh, using these contacts, we were able to, to do a lot. And this was, of course, exactly the time when Henry Cow was, had already decided to break up four months, five months earlier. So we were coming to the end. So the Art Bears were the, the band that came after Henry Cow. The first Art Bears record was actually recorded by all of Henry Cow, but they had a disagreement about it coming out as a Henry Cow record, so it came out as an Art Bears record. And then shortly after that, the Art Bears just became the trio of Chris Cutler, Fred Frith, and Dagmar Kraus. It became really a studio-only band. And like the later Henry Cow, it was politically left, complicated music. Very, very good. One of the things that I find so interesting about Art Bears is that, yes, they were writing this music in the late 70s. It hasn't aged a day. And we had a meeting at sunrise. All the bands came to Switzerland and we had a meeting where we formally decided to continue and we decided to invite another three bands, which were Art Bears, obviously, Aksak Mabul and Art Zoid. Aksak Mabul were from Belgium. They made two records. The first record is almost a Mark Hollander solo record. I mean, there's some other musicians on it. And the second album has a full band, uh, but it's kind of like a rock and opposition all-stars group. I mean, Michelle Berkman from Universe Zero is on it, and Fred Frith and Chris Cutler on it. And of course, all these people uh, uh, bring their own influences onto it and give it kind of, like I said, the, the rock and opposition all-stars sound. I decided to travel from London to Brussels and meet Marc Hollander of Aksak Maboul, who is running the independent music label Cram Discs, and once in the region to drive to northern France and meet Art Zoid. Show it up, 
Yeah, the, the bands in rocking oppositions were very different. It was Chris Cutler's uh, selection. I mean, there was an ethical or political connection in the sense that these people were producing their own music and, and economic, you know, taking control of the economic means of uh, distribution. But uh, aesthetically, the bands were quite different. Rocking opposition was important in the sense that show that you can do it on your own and you can collaborate with other musicians in other countries. Soon after, all these other labels, especially in the UK, a lot of, uh, you know, in the wake of the post-punk period, uh, a lot of other people were doing that, so it was, imp it was an important moment. Artzoid actually kind of started their life in a similar way to Stormy Six in that I, I think they were like a pop band and they slowly turned into this other thing that was definitely not a pop band. They were very classically oriented and they had no drummer, which was very unique. And they had a lot of musical similarities, I think, to Universe Zero. I know that when the groups heard each other, they were both like, hey, that kind of sounds like us. But they also worked together quite a bit. Arzo était beaucoup plus droit et, et beaucoup plus froid dans sa démarche, c'est vraiment un. When Artzoid joined the Rio movement, they were already around for 10 years. Une petite chanson d'amour dans une petite boîte à musique qui s'intitule Balade. Today, Artzoid is best described as an electronic music group that works for film, ballet, and the other stage performances. The Studio Artzoid is located in Valenciennes, a beautiful town in northern France. Gérard Aubet, one of the original band members of Artzoid, is the director of the Studio Artzoid, a center for music research, development, and the creation of new works. J'étais stupéfait de ces musiques, notamment électroniques, que j ai, j ai, qui me faisaient mentalement réfléchir, voyager, me poser des questions et qui, pour moi, représentaient beaucoup plus le monde d'aujourd'hui et qui représentaient l'univers dans lequel j'étais né, puisque j'étais né dans une ville euh, du nord de la France qui était en reconstruction après la guerre. Et donc, euh, ma jeunesse était... C'était les machines, les, les marteaux-piqueurs, euh, les usines qui travaillaient la nuit avec les fumées rouges. En fait. Donc ça m'a... Ça correspondait à cette musique pour moi. C'était des musiques euh, déjà industrielles. La deuxième, c'est que c'était quand même une musique qui spirituellement niait aussi les... Euh, enfin, niait, euh, euh, s'écartait, je dirais, des... des des musiques anglo-saxonnes de, de l'époque. Et juste après, en rentrant de Londres, Univers Zero nous ont dit que Chris Katla était intéressé pour qu'on soit dans le mouvement. Et, et on s'est naturellement rencontrés. Et, et voilà, on a fait partie du mouvement dès le début. Donc ça, c'est l'exemple de, de festival où, que, auquel on participait. Et celui-là avait la particularité que c'était nous qui l'avions organisé à Maubeuge en 1980. Voilà, et donc euh, on avait invité euh, bah, des groupes euh, 
plus ou moins euh, dans Rock in Opposition. Il y avait Visit, il y avait aussi Univers Zero et Arzoid, on avait joué ensemble. Il y avait Phil Minton, il y avait Présent, euh, Geoffrey, Aksak Maboul. Aksak euh, Maboul. Voilà. The Rock in Opposition movement was active from 1978 to 1980. In the midst of it, in 1979, founding member of Univers Zero, Roger Trigo, left Univers Zero to concentrate on his own vision and founded the band Présent. Je voulais faire mon propre band, plus rock, avec un son guitare, plus électrique, mais je ne parvenais pas à trouver les musiciens. Alors je l'ai fait avec Daniel, avec Tristan Chenet, qui jouait à l'époque dans Universal. Il y a un pianiste que j'ai rencontré par hasard. In spite of the fact that the early incarnation of Présent consisted of three quarters of Universero's members, Roger himself, Daniel Dini on drums, and Christian Genet on bass guitar, the music was very different from Universero. By 1980, the rock and opposition movement had lost steam and was fading out. It was quite quick. The trajectory of the whole thing covers not more than 10 months, probably. And it was over because the bands continued to support each other. In any case, they didn't need an organization to do that. The complication of deciding who could be in and who couldn't be in, nobody wanted to deal with that. We'd made our point, so that was the end of it. Je pense que il y a des raisons extrêmement différentes d'appartenir à l'époque pour les groupes pour se réunir dans bloc d'opposition. Un, le, le, le politique. Deux, le, 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 le côté réseau. Et trois, le côté aussi artistique. Certains membres de, de ces groupes étaient un peu politisés, mais au niveau musical, c'était vraiment un désir de, de créer une force. So this was a very important period, especially for me and my group, to understand all these things and to make analysis, political analysis of the show business and things like that. Each band was kind of eventually more involved in itself rather than in being part of something which was maybe bigger. So rock and opposition as a movement, as a collective movement, the idea was still there. Uh, the reason to play that music was still there. It was still um, something which, which, which linked everybody together, but it wasn't necessarily um, an everyday thing. It, it was just from event to event. This one is called Family Cracks. It means uh, the group was separate. One of the members has left. This is a symbol of what's happening. The Rio movement was disbanding. I asked myself, what has happened in the US during this time? And sure enough, I found out that Giorgio Gomelsky had moved to New York in 1978, trying to open the US market to the European bands that he was working with, such as Magma and Gong. He established the Zoo Club in Manhattan. Because that's what Giorgio knew. You know, Giorgio was a bit, bit like us running the Rock and Opposition Festival in London. We were bringing the people that we knew to say, look, look, look what's happening. Interesting stuff happening that you don't know about. And Giorgio was doing the same thing. Giorgio was the guy who was always on the spot. You know, anybody that can discover the Yardbirds and the Rolling Stones and John McLaughlin and Magma, he's obviously got his ear to the ground. Giorgio went to America and was going to do the same thing there. You know, he was going to build up something from scratch in America. And he invited the people that he knew, which made a lot of sense. And of course, there was a public ready to listen. I mean, it had always been a public in America, 
ready to listen. You know, who was listening to Frank Zappa? They're there. They're always there. The question is, is somebody working hard enough to make it possible to stand in front of them and play? In 1978, Georgia organized the Zoo Manny Festival of Progressive Music and brought European bands to the U.S. I wanted New York underground artists to meet European artists, and I wanted European artists to come to America. <laughs> and that's what the Zoo Manny Festival was, you know, and it was also to help that movement along because it didn't exist here. Zappa was having terrible difficulties. You know, making records and, and, and existing. The drummer of Henry Cow and Art Bears, Fred Frith, also from Henry Cow and Art Bears, David Allen from Soft Machine. The Muffins came here, they came from Baltimore. It was at the Intermedia Theater in New York, and that was the first exposure for the, the Muffins, uh, really outside of the Washington area. We got to play live in New York at this thing. One of the unique things that, that set the, the, the Muffins apart is we were probably the only band in the Washington market that was actually uh, playing you know, music that was in a similar vein to the, some of the Canterbury people you know, and Henry Cow. But we went on like for 16 hours. The police came to shut us down. They cut off the electricity. It was 2,000 seater theater. I have to hand it to Giorgio. You know, he was a visionary you know, for bringing this together. This was the kickstart for the New York avant-garde scene as well. So there were connections back and forward across the Atlantic after that. Because there was a connection between what the so-called rock and opposition European bands were doing and what the New York improvisers and the New York experimental scene were doing. And they intermingled very, very quickly. Etron Fula Le Blanc, they were actually interesting of the rock and opposition bands because they came to the US three times and something that nobody else did. When they played outside of France, part of their charm was Ferdinand's uh, English translations of the song lyrics. They were funny and, and odd and, and uh, almost surrealistic, funny poems. The big thing, uh, though, uh, for us, which was absolutely magic, was that the audience uh, was at the meeting point. We played, for example, this um, small music university in Woodstock that was organized by, they had a, a student club there and they organized a concert for us there. It was just magic. Rock and opposition, we couldn't have said it better ourselves. Sleepy Time really related to that, that kind of defiance of the music machine and the business machine that runs so much of what popular music is about and what rock has turned into. Night in vain. Obviously, Sleepy Time was from Oakland, California. And in 1999, it was lucky enough to get the ambassador of rock and opposition to come and live and teach at Mills College, which is a breeding ground for radical thought and improvisation and really challenging music. And the fact that Fred Frith came and headed up the department there was inspiring to so many musicians there who possibly could name him as one of their chief influences. California had been traditionally a breeding ground for radical music. Frank Zappa and Captain Beefheart had collaborated there since the mid-60s, influencing European and American musicians alike. In, in Europe, he was admired. They both were. This way of uh, not respecting the, the rhythm, the classical rock rhythm, was uh, allowed, that everything was available, and that we just need to work hard to make it happen. And that's what we did. And it, it, it is a very strange paradox, because uh, these guys are, Captain Bifart and Zappa, are for me very American. And at the same time, they gave us the possibility to become much more French-oriented musicians than we used to be before. Dumour, quelque chose qui était amené dans, dans, dans la construction musicale, euh, qui était rare en, en musique, euh, euh, ou inexistant d'ailleurs, en musique classique. 
The avant-garde rock scene was becoming noticeable in California in the late 70s, with bands like Five UUs founded by Dave Cameron, who has since been a drummer for American bands such as U Totem and Thinking Plague, and Belgian bands Présent and Aranis. Cameron also collaborates with different musicians, including Chris Cutler and Fred Frith. Beefheart and Zappa, uh, I think anybody from my part of town was very much influenced by them because they were the most radical things from there. And their influence spread beyond California, beyond the United States. They went to Europe in a lot of ways. And I hear that even in rock and opposition music like Daniel Denise drumming, and these are polyrhythmic patterns, and, and it's right up my alley. And it's, we had surf music and we had Zappa and Beefheart and you sort of were a fan of one or of the other. And so the freaky people were into Zappa and Beefheart, and the normal people were into surf music. In the late 70s, I heard Henry Cow, and this was the thing that kind of changed my whole opinion about music. I realized that there was something more in rock music than what I was playing, which was quasi new wave or about to be that, or King Crimson or Genesis or the things that I'd been weaned on and I grew up on. And I realized there was something a little bit more and I thought they were head and shoulders above everything. So I listened very, very carefully to Henry Cow and that's the thing that sort of changed my whole life musically. The career of Henry Cow summed up in 10 CDs, basically. Okay. Well, yeah, it's all live recordings. The point about Henry Cow really was it was a live band. So the records don't tell you that much. The records tell you what we did when we went into the studio. Although the Rio movement had disbanded, Chris Cutler continued Rio's work. He created the independent record label Recommended Records and made the music available to a disconnected audience. It's the same as the rock and opposition idea. There were bands making records all over Europe and in America, like the Residents, for instance, with no distribution in this country. Nobody had heard of them. So it seemed obvious that somebody had to get it all together and put it under one heading and make it available, and that's why Recommended started. This is where a lot of people learned about that kind of music. I think it was around 1981. I was searching for this album by this German band called Faust, and I found it in a local record shop in Tel Aviv. Uh, it was very hard record to find, and uh, when I opened it, I discovered a little yellow small note saying, We have a mail order service that supplies and informs about many international independent releases from 26 countries would otherwise be unavailable, from Japan to Mexico to Russia. Since 1979, we've also operated our own record label with classical pressings and art printed covers. We do not operate recommended as a business, which means we do not have to play the market. We just do what we like. And so I immediately ordered, they had then what's called the recommended record a sampler, which had all the rock in opposition groups on that record. For me, it was like an opening of a, a, a door to a world, um, to a new world musically. New independent record labels also emerged on the continent, like Belgian Cram Discs, founded in early 1980 by Mark Hollander. So the label officially started in early 81 with uh, the re-release of my first Exact Boot album and seven inches by two English bands that I was friends with. I'm attracted to people who are a little displaced. Sometimes bands are comprised somebody from one country with somebody from a second country who meet in the third country and they think of music of a fourth country but what they end up doing is music from a fifth country that doesn't exist if you like. We have an artist called Aya from Chicago. They're second generation Chicanos. They're inspired by crowd rock and uh, electronic music and, uh, and, and Phil Spector and all, all kinds of things, but in a very uh, 2010 way. Uh, but they sing in Spanish, so some people think it's world music, but I don't. 
and they're based in Chicago, I mentioned that. So yeah, in a way, to, to go back to the subject of your film, uh, you could say that this is very much in the, in, in the spirit of uh, what recommended records were, were doing, with, but with different music. It's being attracted to people who do very peculiar styles of music in different parts of the, of the world. It's not world music, it's music from all over the world. In the early 80s, Steve Feigenbaum founded the independent record label Cuneiform Records in Silver Spring, Maryland, and made Rio-related music available to an American audience. I started Cuneiform Records in 1984, and by 1985, uh, on our third record, uh, we released Présence Le Poisson qui Ren Fou, which was their second album. And we continued in that vein of releasing various styles of music, uh, avant, progressive, including many rock and opposition uh, related releases, which is, I think, what we continue to do to this day. Franco Fabri of Stormy Six calls this the last rock and opposition festival, even though it's not called a rock and opposition festival. And you can see the rock and opposition bands. I mean, you can see Stormy Six, Universe Zero, uh, Etron Fou Le Blanc. So there's three out of five. Um, Henry Cowell didn't exist anymore at that point, but you can see Chris Cutler's group afterwards, which was Kasiber, and Fred Frith's group after that, which was Skeleton Crew. But I kind of think the most interesting thing about this poster and the bands that played there is you can see that the post-punk and art-punk thing has coalesced and become a part of the movement. It's not standing still, it's, it's using uh, the new stuff and taking from that and you know changing, changing and, and developing and, and not staying static. The distribution efforts of the new independent record labels that emerged in the early 80s helped to get the music of Rio bands and other marginalized bands out into the world. Soon, musicians from all over absorbed the music and became associated with Rio, like Miriador from Canada. My name is Pascal Globinski. I play keyboard in Miriador. To a new listener, I would say that Miriador music is like a weird soundtrack for a weird movie. So we were associated with the REO movement, but it was not uh, our idea to be mm -hmm. in the REO movement. We were associated for the music we made, but also for the way we were working, doing the special music, uh, yeah. like on, on our side mm -hmm. and, and... Apart being... from the industry. Yes. As a result of their association with the Rio brand, Miriador began working on projects with other Rio musicians, like Lars Holmer from Zamla Mamas Mana and Michel Bergmans from Univers Zero. Lars Holmer has always been a hero of mine. We played at the Gouveia Festival in Portugal in 2005. We played there with Lars Holmer and Michel Bergmans from Univers Zero. bands were associated with the Rio label, including Thinking Plague, a band from Denver, Colorado, founded by Michael Johnson and Bob Drake. In 1978, I moved to Denver, and I wanted to meet some musicians to make funny music with. I went to uh, walk down the road to the nearest music store and, and uh, wrote out a little sign, a new bass player just moved into town, wants to make music uh, inspired by, I'm sure I said, Beatles, Yes, and Henry Cow. And I hung it up there on the bulletin board with all the other, you know, billions of other musicians looking for bands to play with. Bob Drake and I had met some years before 
as a result of a advertisement on a, a, on a bulletin board at a music store, just a little note, uh, looking for musicians who are into Yes and Henry Cow. It's like, what, you know? But when we made our first record, which we made with our own money, which we made 500 copies, limited edition, hand-painted covers, we sent one of those to Chris Cutler at uh, Recommended Records, hoping that he would distribute them for us. And lo and behold, he said, send me 200. And so we were like, oh, we're on the map, you know, whatever. Um, so he knew about us. He became a distributor for us. Um, we, we, were, we were in his universe. We were a very tiny little star in his universe. Then he came through playing drums with Per Ubu. He came through town here. And we went to see him. And I had a tape. And it was most of the music from In This Life on a tape. And I said, can I give you this tape? And then later we got a letter from him saying, what are you planning to do with this uh, music? And we wrote back and said, well, we hope that we're going to release it on RER. <laughs> and boom, so it came to be. And uh, uh, In This Life became the first um, CD that RER manufactured in America. The first label I, I heard <clears throat> applied to um, Thinking Plague's music that stuck with me and that I remembered and that I liked pretty well was avant progressive music because I had been a fan of progressive rock in the 70s at a time when I thought it was genuinely progressive and to say avant progressive was like, well, that, that fits. <laughs> great deal of frustration with the way um, humankind are managing the planet. For me, it's, it feels like an obligation to be the critic or to be the observer of the ills of the world in the music. <laughs> One of the things I would like to impart to um, some people that say they have difficulty with, uh, with um, what they call dissonance or atonality, if you think of it as a palette of colors, if you're painting, you're painting, say, with five colors. But if you can expand your palette, and what I'm talking about is moving into the more expanded and more complex and more extended harmonies and tonalities which really began in the, mainly in the 20th century, you have a much larger palette and you can express much more uh, wide range and subtle range of emotions. When I'm writing music for Thinking Plague, I'm always trying to writing from the gut as opposed to just from the head. Thinking Plague has gone through a series of changes in personnel over the years. The personnel is the biggest challenge, trying to find people who can and who will do this kind of music. It's a special kind of person, and you oftentimes have to look all over the, the country, all over the continent, and sometimes across the sea. However, Denver seems to be a good place for this kind of music. Michael Johnson joined forces with neighboring band Hamster Theater, founded by Dave Willey. Michael plays guitar in Hamster Theater, and Dave plays bass guitar in Thinking Plague. We decided to go and visit Dave Willey.
I became interested in European folk music largely through my father's tastes, who liked uh, Bela Bartok, and we had a really good library in the town I grew up in, Corvallis, Oregon, that had billions of records. So I would go check stuff out of the library when I was a kid just because I liked the cover. I formed Hamster Theater in Boulder after coming back from Europe. I saw uh, Lars Homer and Femme Soker and Scott, that band that he had after Zamla. Lars Homer was a pretty huge influence on me, the sound of the accordion. I just loved it when he played it. And um, I thought his compositions were more friendly than a lot of the tonalities that I was hearing in, you know, especially in the 80s. Fred Frith's Helter Skelter, I saw that. I just started getting musical ideas, influenced, of course, by a lot of the music that I saw and was listening to when I was there. And it's, it's really not a fancy guitar on. It's a, I got it at a Mexican curio shop, but it, I really like the tone. It's got six strings. It's, instead of an upright bass, that's what I use on a lot of hamster theater and other recordings. Accordion's always been integral to hamster theater sound. I don't know why, or my own sound. Um, I put it on almost everything, <laughs> so. It's interesting that Hamster Theater is in Boulder because, you know, when we do play out, you know, we, we get a, a hundred people or so coming to see us, but our main sales are European. And we have yet to play in Europe. Uh, you know, of course we'd love to, but haven't been invited to those festivals yet. have been the 90s before I heard the term RIO or rock in opposition and, and, and found out that the music that we do is considered rock in opposition by some people and I, and I had no idea what they were talking about frankly. I don't necessarily feel like I'm attempting to create rock and opposition music. Our audience are people, you know, who, who listen to music that is called rock and opposition, um, as do I. So you've got these five rock and opposition bands and they're for the most part playing uh, complicated or more avant-garde uh, progressive rock type music. So these other bands come along in the 80s and maybe even into the 90s when it's not a particularly active style and either the public or the press or people just sort of say, well, it sounds like Universe Zero, or it sounds like Henry Cow, or it sounds, and so it because well, it sounds like you know, well, they're 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 a rock and opposition band. I think it kind of it, it kind of happened that way, and certainly the bands didn't do that. I hear this term used quite a lot, you know, Rio. So it may simply be that there has to be some category to put things into, and you find the one that fits best, or you think fits best. I mean, I'm quite happy that the idea that the that it's become kind of public property.
back to it, and there's a lineage right back to what Chris Cutler was doing with Henry Cow, you know, striking out and forming this very, very independent network and doing, doing everything themselves. Um, that's always the way I've operated. Me, I can re-release whatever I want that I've done since the age of 18. I've got all the... I own all the rights to everything. I've got all the, you know, I've got all the recordings. I don't have to seek legal, you know, advice to, to, to get my own music out. Today, the label of avant-garde progressive rock music has become a term that serves as an umbrella for a wide range of this kind of music. The great thing about Avon Progressive as a label, I think, is it's very broad, and you can put a lot of stuff in it. You can put, you can put, uh, you can put the rock and opposition bands in it. You can put uh, magma in it. You can put uh, the the new young bands that play in the clubs that you know do what might they call you know do math rock or or whatever. I mean, it's like it's just this huge umbrella, and uh, it's a huge umbrella of unpopular music that you can all you know. That, that people who do like it can kind of use, and it doesn't exclude anybody. Magma has never been a part of the rock in opposition movement. Instead, it operated in a different orbit, creating its own style of music that is known today as Zeul music, a subgenre of progressive rock. Avant tout, la musique c'est une matière, l'esprit aussi. Je disais en définissant le terme Zeul qui est le nom que j'ai donné à cette musique, Zul, qui est un terme vibratoire. Je dis ce qui veut dire l'esprit au travers de la matière, c'est-à-dire passer la matière sans heurts. s'est inspiré de, de quelque chose de toute manière. Peut-être Magma n'est pas la plus mauvaise école, mais je ne pense pas à ça. De toute manière, ce sont les gens qui peuvent dire « Moi, j'appartiens à un courant, Zeul, ça, je ne sais pas. » Ils le disent. C'est peut-être plus compliqué. Throughout its career of almost half a century, Magma has gone through many changes in the lineup, and it also went through a breakup period of 13 years before it re-emerged in 1996. Donc toujours être sur la corde raide dans la vie, à la fois, et avoir envie de continuer sans chuter, tomber dans les les méandres des méandres des eaux saumâtres. Donc euh, c'est très difficile de, de poursuivre un but, prendre des risques suffisamment et d'avoir la chance de pouvoir le faire, de s'en sortir vivant pour continuer encore. C'est un peu comme ça tous les jours. Je, je vis beaucoup au jour le jour. Avec la qui By the end of the 80s, most of the original rock and opposition bands had disbanded. Univers Zero, however, re-emerged with new players in 1997 after a breakup time of 11 years in which Daniel Denis worked with Art Zoid for a seven-year period. When I participated with Art Zoid, J'ai pu avoir l'occasion d'aller jouer dans beaucoup, beaucoup de pays autour du globe. Et beaucoup de gens m'ont demandé pourquoi Universero n'existe plus. Et, et petit à petit, bon voilà, j'ai fait revivre Universero en tant que CD, avec des musiciens que de créer un groupe existant, avec des, des musiciens. Donc j'ai repensé à Michel. Des 
dis ça comme Kurt, Dimitri, et Martin et Pierre amènent un côté fraîcheur qui, qui est très positif pour, pour, pour cette évolution. While Universero was coming back again as a performing band, second generation Rio band Présent was re-emerging as well. Nothing was heard from Roger Trigo after the first two albums of Présent. But in 1995, the band reformed with a new lineup featuring Roger's son Reginald as second guitarist and drummer Dave Kerman. In 1998, Présent came to the U.S. for the very first time and undertook a huge full U.S. tour, logging in 10,000 miles and five weeks of concerts. I remember that tour as being a sort of David Lynch version of the Odyssey with a touch of Blues Brothers, you know, because one day you think you're a big star, I mean, you play in the, in the United States, that's great, and the day after you're in the most dull, motel on the road you can imagine. Even I as an American hadn't been to most of the skates that we went through. So we actually stopped in places that were hot or cold or I had stereotypes about that I was completely wrong about. Wonderful, wonderful. Exhausting, exhausting but wonderful. This my best, one of my best souvenirs. In 2011, Universero and Présent joined forces with a third band from Belgium, Aranis, founded by Joris van Finkelrooyen. All 17 musicians would perform in a project with the title Once Upon a Time in Belgium, from the French part of Belgium, where Universero and Présent are based, we drove to the Flemish part and met Joris. There was, was a guy who told me, when I listen to your music, I want to laugh and cry at the same time. And that's the real thing that I want to say with my music. Come inside. Thank you. called it the first time when we, we had a CD, Acoustic Chamber Rock. So it's not really chamber rock like Universero because we don't have uh, instruments like drums or bass guitar, but we play with the same spirit. So we play acoustic instruments, classical instruments, with the spirit as, as it was uh, an electric guitar or uh, a heavy uh, drums or whatever. <laughs> We are here in a place, Madame Fortuna. It's a small art center here in the middle of Antwerp. And um, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a nice place because they organize a lot of things, uh, combinations with the theater, with the music, but also with film. Sometimes we do rehearsals here, but we also can do recordings here because it's a very nice room with a very nice sound. My job, besides playing flute, is to organize the tours. I try to get as much as concerts here in Belgium and a bit abroad as possible. It's a full-time thing. The music is good, but you have to sell it. So uh, I am good in selling Joris's music. <laughs> marketing efforts have earned Aranis many festival appearances and also the attention from the avant-garde progressive rock sphere at a time when Joris was planning to add drums to the band. The thing that surprised me the most about Aranis is actually they asked me to play with them because I'm kind of noted for being a very loud drummer and 
Their music is so quiet and so acoustic, and uh, but they seemed to have faith in the fact that I would be able to interpret it well. And so I came over and I really worked hard to learn it and I play with chopsticks to be s quiet and delicate and, and play melodically, almost for the first time in my life. When Aaron is searched for a new piano player, they invited Pierre Chevalier, keyboardist of Présent and Universero. I think each band has a very strong identity. Présent, I would define as the punk one of the bunch. The electric aspect of the music, the way it's written, we always consider this as a sort of mission and we are some sort of samurai of uh, rocking opposition music. Universero is different, there is still a very strong rock feel, but I would feel more of the classical influences and also some folklore influences. Well, Aranis, it's totally different approach to the way of working. We are in that band looking for a sort of uh, perfection. Three Belgian bands met the next day in a little French-speaking village in the south of Belgium for a rehearsal in preparation for their first big performance together on stage at the Rock in Opposition Festival 2011 in Carmaux, southern France. Once Upon a Time in Belgium is a project between uh, Universal Présent and Tyrannis. We, we have a program and, uh, that we will play all together at the Rio Festival this year in 2011. And it's, it's a huge project. Within this context, once upon a time, I see Aranis on one side, I see Prasant on the other, and Universe Zero sort of in the middle. So there's this very precise sound, there's this sort of loose, loud sound, and there's something in the middle here that would be Universe Zero. And when you put it all together in one thing, I think again that we run the whole gamut, and that's what's most interesting about it. Bom, 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 and give you the beat and keep you but But this sounds good if you don't mind. Bringing 17 musicians together under one roof is a real challenge, but it seemed that the musicians were up to it, working continually on perfection. We like to make things that uh, on paper should be impossible. And uh, this is one of them. 
During a break in a nearby cafe, we said goodbye, and we were looking forward to meeting them again for their big performance later that week in Carmaux, southern France, during the Rockin' Opposition Festival that is held there every year in September. From a rainy day in Belgium, we traveled to southern France, Toulouse, and from there we drove to the Pyrenees to find the little town of Carmaux, in which the Rock in Opposition Festival is held every year. The festival is an initiative of Roger Trigot and Michael Bessette, a French music manager and organizer who has supported the avant-garde progressive rock scene in the last three decades. On avait depuis quelques années l'idée de relancer, de réactiver un réseau euh, dynamique euh, autour de ces musiques. Oui, au départ, cet endroit, ce lieu, était un ancien mine de charbon à ciel ouvert. Puis la mine a fermé. Un homme politique a eu l'idée de créer un complexe de loisirs avec une salle de spectacle. Et moi, mon parcours, en fait, je suis passé du charbon au rock. Et nous avons beaucoup, beaucoup travaillé pour que ce lieu existe un jour. The first Rock in Opposition Festival was held in 2007, inviting Chris Cutler and legendary bands Magma, Faust and Présent. Since then, the festival is held here every year in September, showcasing old and new avant-garde progressive rock bands from around the globe, like Yugen from Italy. Our most complex piece uh, is probably Bikime, which is taken from our last album, Ibitul. There are many features that uh, makes it uh, the, the most difficult uh, song because uh, it's uh, a typically multi-layered composition, as I usually write. We really had to find a new formula to make the Francesco Zago composition uh, work in a live setting. In Iridul we, we had uh, a lot of uh, guests from America in particular, uh, and we had uh, four members from uh, Thinking Plug. Uh, we had uh, Landy Falco, we had uh, Dave Wiley on electric bass, who played the whole album uh, except for one track, played by Guy Seguer, former Universal bass player. And we had Mike Johnson, who played uh, some solos and loops uh, with his guitar on uh, two songs, and uh, David Kerman, who played On La Bivinto d'Aqua too.
I think it's so important that today the, the bands could collaborate each other because they can play in the same level, with the same vi musical vision, and uh, uh, with the internet, with the exchanging of files that is more easier, it's absolutely better and easier to make these things today. Well, I really liked uh, Jürgen. Uh, for me, it's the, the band that is probably the closest to the real feeling with real complex uh, music, and, and they really pulled it off. I was wondering about that, because the, knowing the records, um, I thought, well, it's, it's such a difficult music to play, so I, let's see how they do it live. But Jürgen is terrific as well. Alors le public qui vient au Rock in Opposition euh, est à 50% constitué de non-français, Moyen-Orient, euh, Europe, toute l'Europe, Australie, euh, Japon, états unis Amérique du Sud. Je pense que s'ils viennent ici, c'est essentiellement parce qu'ils viennent chercher une musique qui a marqué le mouvement progressif avec, euh, autour de groupes mythiques comme Magma. It is like a big family to being here. I discovered the music while hearing my first Henry Carr record. And for me, it, it changed completely my life. And there was a friend of mine who played a uh, third album of uh, Henry Cow. Hence uh, the song, Henry Cow. Um, and before that, I was just into the normal pop of like Santana and uh, that sort of thing. And this really blew my mind because uh, I, I heard songs that I couldn't dance to because they, they were odd measures and that sort of thing and uh, Doug McCrouse is singing and it was something so special. Nous aimons beaucoup aussi cette manière de jouer japonaise qui pour nous est très surprenante parce que on dirait que les japonais sont toujours en train de courir dans un métro. <laughs> C'est très surprenant pour nous. Je crois que les Japonais sont des gens qui sont très doués et qui travaillent beaucoup la musique. got uh, dozens of different projects and different bands, all uh, very, very uh, diverse, but uh, at the same time very radical and uh, experimental, with a very distinct uh, kind of uh, energy and uh, sometimes even aggression. Thank you. Japanese people prefer more normal <laughs> pop, pop music. <laughs> While enjoying the nice fall weather of southern France outside Le Maison, everybody was looking forward to the performance of Once Upon a Time in Belgium. One of the songs to be played is New York Transformations, composed by Kurt Boudet of Univers Zero. So tonight we will play a composition of me, which is called New York Transformations. At that moment I had a girlfriend. She went to discover New York and when she came back, in fact, she was uh, totally transformed. The idea of a composition which really uh, starts really like uh, easy going, uh, there's a little um, good feeling in it, it's a little sad in the same time and, and then in fact it starts transforming without that you notice it, you're in the middle of a punk band.
in fact it's two it's two big parts the, the beginning is like how it was and a little bit thinking and then the, the changing is coming and then after yeah that's voila it's the end It was uh, Brinson, Inevazero, and uh, Aranis. It was the best performance I've ever heard in my life. For me, it was the best concert. I, I have no words for it to explain what it was. It was, um, in German, I would say it was a Vollendung, Offenbarung. Uh, selon les périodes, uh, selon les instruments, selon les musiciens, selon selon ce qu'on ce qu'on vivait aussi à ce moment-là, la musique a évolué. Quand on me demande quel est ton ton CD préféré, uh, c'est toujours difficile à dire parce que c'est chaque période est très importante pour 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 le groupe. I think that uh, new bands coming out, younger musicians who finding inspiration through Universe Zero and and some of the other bands that were part of. Uh, uh, rock and opposition. That's a major victory because um, that means that um, they've effectively carried the torch a bit further along. After we played um, one night at the Rock and Opposition Festival in 2009, we were back in my room, we were just having a bit of a, you know, relaxing, and it was uh, James McGull from uh, Magma and it was Keith from Presant. And Keith was saying to me, so how many, how many groups do you play? And I said, oh, about, I think about four or five bands. And he said, yeah, that's about average. And James McGill from Magma was saying, well, I'm in, I'm in nine bands. And I think to people who aren't part of this world, when they say to me, God, you're in, you're in so many bands. But I think when you're part of this world, you sort, you sort of have to be just to, just to get by, just to pay the rent. And even then it's a struggle. Even then you have to have a, you often have to have a day job as well. Musicians are just having to adjust to different circumstances. They're having to adjust to smaller audiences, fewer people that care about what they're doing. Bands are not going to stop doing gigs. People are not going to go stop going to see bands doing gigs. They're not going to stop listening to music. And there will be a new medium, which is a kind of art medium, you know, where certain kinds of music will be like certain kinds of art now where they will exist in small editions and people will want the edition. À l'époque où il y a de magma, on disait tout ce n'est pas possible de faire ça, ce n'est pas possible. Et aujourd'hui on dira pareil, ce n'est pas possible. Et c'est possible. Tout est toujours possible. Même dans les pires circonstances, il y a toujours quelque chose de possible.
Thank you.